All righty, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, my name is John Gershman I'm at uh, NYU and with the New York Southeast Asian Network. And on behalf of the network, we'd like to welcome everyone who's here today for what we are sure is gonna be a very interesting uh, roundtable discussion on uh, three works by some of the leading scholars on Southeast Asia. Um, the way we're gonna proceed, just to kind of do the logistics up front, um, if you have questions, please throw them into the Q&A box. Um, we're gonna have a discussion amongst the panelists for the first 30 minutes or so, and then we'll throw things open to, uh, to questions from the audience that I'll facilitate. Um, and so we're gonna start off with asking each of our panelists to give kind of a, on the off chance that those of you attending the webinar have not yet read all of these works, to give the opportunity for the authors to give kind of a capsule summary um, of each of their, of the books that we're focusing on, and then we'll move into the conversation. So if we could start with uh, Professor John Seidel of the London School of Economics, um, whose recent book, Republicanism, Communism and Islam, Cosmopolitan Origins of Revolution in Southeast Asia, cover shot available. Um, and John, could you lead us off? Sure, so um, I hope you can hear me and many thanks for the invitation, the opportunity to speak. Um, my new book uh, draws on the work of a wide range of really great historians of Southeast Asia, who over the past three decades have combined to present a kind of outline and a composite understanding of modern Southeast Asian history that it seems to me is very different from what became the established narrative template uh, in the late 20th century, drawing on Benedict Anderson's imagined communities, a template that kind of begins with the emergence of modern, mostly colonial states, and then we see the rise of national and nationalist consciousness and the transition to uh, independent nation states. And that's the kind of narrative structure uh, around which Southeast Asian history is taught and understood. And so the book instead um, provides an account that shows how long distance trade and incorporation of the region into the world capitalist economy helped to form and transform Southeast Asian societies in ways which actually strengthened their connections to other parts of the world and enabled both the survival and evolution in some cases of established forms of cosmopolitanism inherited from the early more modern era uh, and also the emergence and expansion of new forms of modern cosmopolitanism over the late 19th and early 20th centuries rather than just the rise of nationalism and nationalist consciousness, national, nationalist identities and uh, attachments. And so then the book shows how the, the three great revolutions, uh, the so-called nationalist revolutions, as they're usually understood in modern Southeast Asia, the Philippine, Indonesian and uh, Vietnamese revolutions were profoundly shaped in their timing, their forms, their trajectories, their outcomes and consequences both by international conjunctures on the one hand, and also by both old and new cosmopolitanisms and cosmopolitan connections on the other. So overall, what I'm trying to present in the book is a kind of denationalized, transnationalized and internationalized account of modern Southeast Asian history and a comparative analysis. Uh, I should emphasize that a comparative analysis of the region's three great revolutions against this kind of uh, alternative template. So that's, that's my book. Great, thank you so much, John. Um, and next, uh, if we could move to uh, Professor Martina Nguyen, Professor of History at Baruch College, um, who is the author of On Our Own Strength, The Self-Reliant Literary Group and Cosmopolitan Nationalism in Late Colonial Vietnam. We need to do a, a kind of collage of cover art at some point for, for a future poster. <laughs> Right. Thanks so much, John, and thanks so much to Nysian for organizing uh, this book conversation. I'm, I, you know, I'm really, really excited to, um, you know, have a dialogue with my colleagues here today about our new books. Um, so uh, my book, uh, basically, it examines the career of arguably the most important intellectual movement in interwar Vietnam. This was a period where. Vietnam was occupied, was a French colony, you know, and was, um, you know, occupied um, by the French. And this is, you know, it covers the period of about 19, 
1932 to about 1939, roughly the, the, the decade of the 1930s. And this decade is actually really important in uh, Vietnamese history in the sense that it is their crucial years for the formation of Vietnamese national identity as well as Vietnamese um, nationalism and politics. Um, and this is a, a, a time where Vietnamese intellectuals forged a kind of uh, new political relationships and identities that's going to um, that's going to define the revol revolution that is to come. Um, so I work on a group of intellectuals called the Self-Reliant Literary Group. In Vietnamese, it's called, they're called Tự Lực Văn Đoàn. Um, and these guys are particularly interesting because they are the kind of leaders or a vanguard of a particular generation of Vietnamese intellectuals. Right? They're all born kind of in the decade that straddles the turn of the century. Um, they are only educated in French and vernacular Vietnamese and have a very kind of you know, uh, they, they're somewhat familiar, but not as you know entrenched in kind of the old Chinese, um, classical Chinese worldview of their predecessors. Um, these guys were best-selling authors, best-selling, you know, journalists, and most famously, they founded the first um, satirical newspaper in Vietnam, uh, basically this, uh, a kind of equivalent of the Vietnamese Onion. Um, and so um, for me, this has been really great because I get to read, you know, not just kind of like government documents and archival stuff. I get to read things like fashion and advertisements and blueprints and art and things like that. And so it's been a real, it's, it's you know, it's fun, you know, to, to, to get to read different types of, of documents. Um, but what really kind of struck me about the group is that, you know, in the Vietnamese historiography, right, so communist historiography, um, you know, very uh, defined by kind of Marxist uh, ideological frameworks, um, this group is presented mostly as literary writers, right? These guys only really wrote fiction. There's a lot of work out there about the group. These guys are super important in the modernization of the Vietnamese novel and, you know, the proliferation of of, you know, Vietnamese and, you know, revolutionizing, um, you know, this, this, uh, um, you know, new forms of, you know, literature and, and culture for that matter. Um, and so, so lots of stuff about that, but actually, you know, the way that these, this group is framed in the historiography by the communist historiography is that, you know, they're mostly cultural, hence they, if, if they're cultural, they can't really be political. Um, they're mostly fiction writers, like they wrote novels, Novels. A lot of their novels are quote unquote bourgeois romanticism. Um, and so, so this kind of, you know, painting them as this kind of like slightly reactionary or collaborationist um, group. Um, you know, they, you know, basically these guys did not demand, you know, the overthrow of French colonialism. Therefore, they cannot be radical enough to be revolutionaries, right? So, so, so this is how they are portrayed in the Vietnamese historiography. Um, for the most part. So what I do is, you know, I, my book is a systematic examination, um, basically a deep dive into the group's journalistic writings, right? So up until this point, a lot of analysis about their novels, short stories, published like books, but not a lot of research into their journalism. And actually their journalism has been, you know, in, in Vietnam at least, been held under restricted access in the National Library for decades. So, you know, what I do is I sort of look at their journalistic writings and I found um, that they were just more, that they were more than a literary group. They were an intellectual movement more broadly and dare I say it, a revolutionary movement. Um, so, so we could talk about, you know, whether or not, you know, how we define revolution in this case, right? Um, but basically they had a vision of what Vietnam should look like in the post-colonial era, right? What happens when France goes away, right? So they had this vision about what Vietnam should look like and they actually had a plan which they attempted to enact to bring this vision to fruition. So um, is that, can I go a little further or, or is that enough time for my, okay. So, so basically my book argues that, um, that the group 
developed a kind of cosmopolitanism, uh, you know, an affinity to a kind of um, uh, uh, an affinity and belief in kind of universal liberal values um, and an, and commitment to intercultural dialogue and borrowing. Um, so they kind of you know uh, developed a kind of discernible cosmopolitanism, which they then you know which they then fashioned a particular vision of Vietnamese nationalism. Um, and basically what these they did was, you know, they thought through, they examined, you know, their society as they saw it and, and really thought about how to reach kind of the everyday Vietnamese, right? And so they had this method of how to reach everyday Vietnamese and how to mobilize everyday Vietnamese. Um, you know, uh, not to give the story away, but ultimately the group does, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they do fail. But that said, you know, members of the group go on to become, um, you know, the, the leader of the group comes, goes on to become the very first Minister of Foreign Affairs under Ho Chi Minh's revolutionary government under the umbrella um, Viet Minh coalition. Um, and so, so these authors will later on have a kind of revolutionary political um, career. Um, but what I'm doing now is sort of looking at their ideas and, you know, this is the period in which they, you know, percolated these ideas of what political activism and revolution looked like. Um, and so, you know, the group is often dismissed for being not revolutionary enough, for being, um, they didn't overthrow, they didn't call for the overthrow of French colonialism, um, that their, you know, their project is pastiche, it's amateurish, it's inconsistent. But actually what I found in my book is that there's an internal logic to it that is based on a very deep understanding of Vietnam's current engagement with French colonialism. So I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then for our third panelist today, uh, Professor uh, Anne Subianto, Professor of Communication, also at Brew College, um, whose book manuscript is <clears throat> Revolutionary Communication, Enlightenment at the Dawn of Indonesia. Anne. Thank you, John. I don't have the book. I don't have the cover, but I'm going to show this in the spirit of <laughs> <laughs> our panel. Um, OK, enough marks. Um, so my book is about um, the communist movement in the early uh, 20th century, okay, 20th century of um, colonial Indonesia. And um, this is a movement that has been said as um, most important in terms of its ability to mobilize popular movement. And this is written by uh, Shira Ishii in his Age in Motion, right? Um, um, and then also, um, a time also in which um, communism was adopted in, in the Indies, right? But my question is this, as there are, as this movement is considered um, the first popular movement in which, uh, you know, working class, uneducated people were able to be mobilized. My question is how were they mobilized? Why is it? that the books that exist that we have from McVeigh, Shira Ishii and other books, you know, do not mention these ordinary people. Who were the ordinary people? How were they mobilized? Okay, so that's my first question. And so uh, at, the, at the beginning of my research, so my book explores these processes of ordinary people that collectively organized, led and mobilized a communist struggle against colonial rule. And in fact, I found that this is the first movement also of or the first anti-colonial movement that mobilized themselves, not through war or through the use of weapons, but rather through the production of what I call revolutionary communication. What were they? Open bar for hadering and public meetings, uh, revolutionary press, um, uh, Sokola Rakyat, people's schools, and the uh, communist songs, production of print matters, communist print matters, novels, short stories, newspapers, as well as uh, the role of sailors and railway workers as human messengers. And I analyze how these rank and file members 
women. I mean, there hasn't been any mention of women so far in the history of this early uh, period of communism. Children, sailors, and members of diverse ethnicities and races produce these communicative practices and technologies of mobilization. Now, my method, I'm a communication scholar, so I use uh, my, the method of, you know, of my expertise of communication history. And what does that imply? Implies, it implies two things. Uh, there are two aspects to that, at least. One is an a, a, a approach to the, the idea of ordinary. What does ordinary mean? Ordinary means looking at the uh, people in their everyday settings, in their everyday processes of mobilization. And that also means to also treat the leaders such as Samaun, Jamaluddin Tamim in their everydayness, in their ordinariness as, as a human being. So, um, and, and I, will, I hope I will be able to act, uh, unpack that again later. And then the second aspect is the global, because Nick Caldry, um, who is a communication scholar at LSE also, where John is, uh, call media as infrastructure of connection. So if we are able to trace need a communication technology and infrastructure um, as a infrastructure of connection and integration and entanglement, then we would be able how, uh, you know, the global and the local actually enmesh and work out together. I mean, they both exist with each other, right? So um, this method allows me to see the centrality of revolutionary communication in the emergence and development of Indonesian communist movement, and also the important role of ordinary people. Whose, whose roles have historically been rendered invisible, right? In leader-centric, party-centric, and formal-centric narrative. And then what are my archives, right? My archive, it, you can't see people's feelings and emotions and, and struggles, you know, everyday struggles in the cold official documents and archives. And of course I read all, you know, most of them. Uh, that's of course, that has been read before by uh, my predecessors. Um, but what I did is I actually read carefully their newspapers. And from them, I was able to uh, unpack and uh, uncover uh, pamphlets, songs, short stories, poems, novels, um, and also reading memoirs. And from this, then I was able to look into this everyday struggle. What were my findings, right? So if you were to look at this, uh, this history of Indonesian communism from a perspective of nationalist perspective, then you would only be able to say that this is a movement that play a role in the national awakening. But you know what, when you look at their wording, their vocabulary, in which they express their hopes and misery and fear, the language that they use were very much global. And my argument is that the Indonesian communist movement in this period should be seen not just as precursor of the Indonesian revolution, but also as a project that combines emancipatory spirit from the enlightenment ideals, as well as communism. Again, I, would, I hope I will be able to uh, show this late, again later. And so this move, it is important to see this movement as highly global, cosmopolitan, and media savvy. This, uh, and, and when I say highly global, cosmopolitan, and media savvy, remember that 1920s is the roaring 1920s, right? Globally, right? So, I mean, imagine, and John, John Seidel, you did, a, you know, an excellent job of ex giving us that picture of, uh, you know, the movement of people, uh, how diverse the Indies were, you know, because of the movement of people and ideas in the Indian Ocean, uh, connecting the colonies, but also connecting India and the Middle East, and then also in the South China Sea. And so this is a very fun period. So think of it as they're speaking about their misery and fear, but they're also talking about hope that is global, right? And, and the ordinary people who are the one who is uh, you know, pro, pro, uh, pro leading this production of revolutionary communication. So in time when the most leaders like Samaun Tan Malaka have been banished in 1923, and if you read McVeigh and Siraishi, it's died down, you know, after 1923. But actually, if you look at the ordinary people, it's, it is in 1924 and 1925 that this movement was came alive and vibrant, led by ordinary people. Um, and so, as, as a part of, and, and so as a part of a chain of global commodity production and distribution, Indonesian communists created a place for themselves in a global society through the language and rhetoric of the enlightenment and communism. And these are their rhetorical strategies, right? Challenging local and traditional authorities, religious, patriarchal and ro royal, as well as colonial power. And hence being communist did not entail betraying local cultures or making themselves inauthentic, 
rather they were keeping pace with the global society. So that is my way of saying that this is not about westernization, cultural imperialism, and but in fact, this is taking up, you know, repurposing resources that are available actually against colonialism, against the West. Great, thank you so much. Um, so maybe to kick off, since at this point, each of you has used the word cosmopolitan in, in your own discussions, and two of you have cosmopolitan in the title of your books. Um, and I'm, I'm always curious about when people use the same word, do they really mean the same thing? So, and maybe we could start with you, Martina, because I don't know, kind of on the face of it, talking about a self-reliant group that's cosmopolitan seems to have a bit of cognitive dissonance to it, right? If you're in a, the traditional sense of thinking about self-reliance, kind of a, a cosmopolitan approach to building self-reliance is not, I don't know, the, the primary way I think we think about that. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how, um, how this particular community, you know, viewed their, their political project of, you know, of self-reliance as being also aligned with a drawing on a tradition of cosmopolitan nationalism or, or the type of nationalism that they created. Oh, you're muted. Great. Great. Can you hear me now? Okay. I'm good. Um, so, so yeah, actually, yeah, I, I, I'm surprised, John, that you didn't notice the most paradoxical juxtaposition of all in the title, which is the juxtaposition of cosmopolitan and nationalism, right? I mean, yeah, the, 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 you know, especially when you think of kind of like, tr you know, old, uh, kind of 17th century, you know, uh, um, formulations of what cosmopolitan cosmopolitanism means right like when we think of like you know the scholarship on Kant or whatever and it, you know it, it, it he there was always this kind of like tension between the being a citizen of the world and being the citizen of a nation right I mean and so 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 you know it was it's 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 and it's kind of antithetical and paradoxical in that way but um you know I mean you, it, the, but the fact that you also say that the fact that these guys are self-reliant, um, you know, there's also a kind of a, a kind of a, a paradoxical um, juxtaposition in it as well. Um, I actually it actually speaks to the overall all argument of my book, right? That there is an internal logic about the self-reliant literary group and their project. Um, in that, you know, you know, as Anne mentioned just now, you know, this is a period of an of enormous intellectual experimentation. Like, you know, when I teach my global history class, I love teaching the interwar years because this is the time of, you know, Freudian psychoanalysis and times of, you know, modernism and Bauhaus and all these kinds of, you know, different ways of thinking aesthetically and intellectually about the world. Um, you know, the, this is also the period where you get very serious critiques, right, of the classical liberal order, right, it, through, you know, communism, fascism, you know, uh, and so, so, so this is a, a period of enormous um, foment, right, and so, so um, yeah, basically the self-reliant literary group, you know, from this kind of, you know, colonial outpost in Vietnam, we're kind of observing all of these things, right, they're reading metropolitan newspapers, they're reading, you know, European newspapers, um, they're reading newspapers from, you know, all, whatever they can get their hands on. Um, and they are, they're, they're being quite pragmatic with it, right? We're going to borrow all these various things. And okay, so we've got a problem in Vietnam with this. I'm going to, we're going to borrow this and then, you know, fix this. And so in the end, what happens is that, you know, it looks like it's kind of pastiche and paradoxical and inconsistent, but that's it. They're, they're actually, you know, they're, they're actually, there's an internal logic to it and you know what emerges is an actual project um, that aims to transform Vietnamese subjectivities right the way that Vietnamese people think it you know internally about themselves and their place in society but also to transform sort of externally Vietnamese society as well um, and so so for this is where the self-reliant part comes in you know, they basically, you know, their attitude was, uh, we, we can't rely on anybody to do this for us. You know, we, we have to make this ourselves, right? And, and so, so, so for the self-reliant literary group, you know, it, it, it's really about the do it yourself, right? To be self-reliant, to, you know, it, it, have these kind of intercultural dialogues and then 
build it ourselves. Um, so I guess that's the sort of internal logics of, you know, nationalism, cosmopolitanism, and the sense of self-reliance here. Great, thank you. Um, maybe I could turn to John next. And as kind of, I heard you talking about specifically because you're you arguing that you're interested in advancing kind of de or denationalizing these these revolutions and these are uh, these revolutions actually have cosmopolitan origins so are you basically saying you know kind of historiography is we what we really saw were national moments in transnational discourse phenomena i.e republicanism communism and islam and it's really a mistake to start kind of in nationalist historiography, we really need to start out here. And that the only way to really think about the history of at least this era of the modern world is from that global level and then drilling down. Like, so how are you understanding kind of cosmopolitan, excuse me, cosmopolitanism in that way? I mean, vis-a-vis -vis nationalism. Vis-a-vis -vis nationalism, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, um, the way I see it, uh, you know, the, the account we get in Benedict Anderson's Imagined Communities uh, is incredibly, amazingly insightful and illuminating, telling us how it was possible uh, in, under certain circumstances for people to begin to imagine themselves, think of themselves in national terms and to develop national and nationalist identities and attachments. And that you know, clearly applies and works for Southeast Asia in, in all sorts of ways, but it leaves two questions to my mind, unanswered, that uh, made me reach for the, the so-called cosmopolitan-isms. Uh, um, and uh, the first is that um, it, it, uh, it makes you wonder how it was possible for all of these, as uh, Anne said, ordinary people <laughs> to mobilize when Anderson, in a kind of interesting sleight of hand, tells us actually that there's a lot less nationalism out there historically than we, we would have otherwise thought, that it, it's, it's utter nonsense to think that you know, people were always nationalists and always had national identities, or that ordinary people did. I mean, he says in the very first page of his book that you know, the Cambodian peasant or Vietnamese peasant couldn't give a fig about the border between the two countries. You know? So how is it possible then that the, all of the uh, women, <laughs> all of the uh, illiterate, all of the uneducated uh, men and women in these countries uh, at the time of the revolution who didn't circulate through the school systems uh, and, and the bureaucracies and partake of the print capitalism and read the newspapers and novels of the time could have possibly imagined themselves as nationalists. So, so how the hell did they get mobilized? You know, how is it possible to mobilize anyone except for these very dandyish intellectuals in their linen suits um, behind a, a, a revolution? Um, so that's the first question, and and there is a, a literature that, that claims uh, to you know to answer this question, but I, I don't think it's it's fully satisfying um, in terms of that kind of split level revolution within the revolution, the connection between the elites and the, the so-called masses. And the second related puzzle that's left unaddressed and unanswered is how can we then explain the differences between not only these three revolutions that had very different forms and outcomes but also those parts of Southeast Asia which had no revolution whatsoever. You know, I think it was Lee Kuan Yew who famously said that Malaysia or Malaya was given its independence on a silver platter uh, by British royalty in uniform. You know, that, that there are parts of Southeast Asia that didn't have any kind of revolution whatsoever. You know, take the Philippines in terms of 1946, but had previously had the first revolution. So to my mind, that, um, that, uh, raises the, the question of the, the particular circumstances and processes of the revolutions and the differences between them. And in, in, in thinking about that, it seems to me that cosmopolitanisms uh, matter in, in the following ways. First of all, in Anderson's book, he talks about what he calls pre-modern, pre-nationalist cosmopolitanism. And he's talking about that in terms of membership in uh, you know, an identity, identification with very broad cosmopolitan communities that have sort of sacred languages and sort of uh, sacral, often religious bases. And, you know, 
unlike perhaps Martina, who, who's you know more interested in the intellectual and ideological notions of cosmopolitanism here, what interests me most is the kind of sociological infrastructure of that pre-modern, I would say, cosmopolitan scholasticism and the ways in which pre-modern forms of Islamic or classical Chinese or Catholic uh, schooling and, uh, and institutions um, provided potential vehicles, uh, institutional, organizational bases, and, and discursive infrastructure that might or might not survive or evolve in one way or another, that might be present and either enable mobilization or obstruct it, uh, uh, you know, or, or its absence might be notable. And, and that these three cases, these three countries vary in terms of what happens to the different forms of early modern cosmopolitan scholasticism and institution building that you find. And that's discussed in the book. And then the second thing is that in, in each one of these societies, the, the great transportation and communications revolutions of the 19th and early 20th century create a, a, a certain kind of cosmopolitanism that Martino was, was also glossing that, that extended into the realm of ordinary people's lives. Um, so that, you know, as I discuss in the book, if you look at popular theater, popular opera, popular music um, in, the er in the era of the, the, the late 19th, early 20th century, you see that the, the forms of music and opera and theater that are there attracting throngs of people in the towns and mar market towns and cities of Southeast Asia are incredibly hybrid in their influence, whether it's Kai Luong uh, in Vietnam or the Comedia uh, in the Philippines, or the Comedy Istanbul uh, in uh, Java and Sumatra and parts of the Malay archipelago. You know, so the, the great epic Tagalog poem of the 19th century, Florante et Laura, it all takes place in Albania. You know, <laughs> the, the Comedy Istanbul, it's, it's a Parsi theater from Bombay. So go figure. Um, so there's that as a kind of common, kind of broad, you know, hybrid cosmopolitanism uh, of modern urban urbanizing Southeast Asia and the port cities and market towns of the region, as as Anne was was also suggesting, but then overlaid on top of that are modern, you know, cosmopolitan connections and modes of organizing and forms of you know infrastructure and discourse that stretch across. Southeast Asia and across the world, and in different ways through solidarity networks, through organizational templates, um, through you know demonstration effects, in different ways enable, uh, in varied ways, alongside very varying international conjunctures, different things to happen or not happen in different forms in these three revolutions. Complicated story. Um, I'll leave it at that for the moment. That's great. No, thank you so much. And and um, just picking up on John's last point, I mean, one of the things that I really found fascinating in your manuscript was the role of sailors and kind of maritime workers as kind of concrete material mediators of this, whether it was, and John discusses in the Vietnam case of like having ties and links to the French Communist Party, and these become, you know, mechanisms of circulating secret material, but that you talk about that this is kind of the material foundation of this kind of process. Um, you and your book, however, don't talk about cosmopolitanism as much as global, although you did in your little summary just a second ago, but you talk about globalization differently and, and are attempting to kind of contrast, it seems to me, and give Whereas there's a dominant narrative that it's about globalization is about westernization and it's purely top down and you're interested in kind of the agency of people who are engaging in what sometimes pejoratively called cultural appropriation, but are taking kind of these themes and practices and ideas and indigenizing localizing them in some way so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that mechanism in the in the context of, of your work and how you do you think it that's you know, related to the, the, an idea of cosmopolitanism or is it something different? Yeah, well, just to answer, thank you, John. That just to directly answer to your last question, I don't think there is a difference between global and co global approach to and cosmopolitanism. Um, but here is how I approach my work. Um, with, as you say, with the dominant narrative of nationalist framework, 
how can I approach Indonesian communism, right? And the communication perspective really helped me to do that because I need to rethink the idea of space, right? When we think about global, we think about space. And oftentimes when we talk, we talk about global history, we think about it in terms of planetary, you know, understanding of everything, right? But actually not. When we think about global, we think about connections, entanglements, but we cannot just talk about connections, entanglements, interactions. We think about the infrastructure of possibility that creates those connections and integrations to occur. And when we think about infrastructure, it is not just shipping lines, it's not just a print, print matters that were circulated around the world that uh, enabled that interaction. It was the agency of the people themselves that decide that they, they want to adopt. They want to adopt this, uh, you know, these ideas or they want to take or repurpose this circulating ideas and ideology, right? So what is really interesting in 1920s communism is that nationalism, nationalism ideas are there. But if you read the newspaper, they don't use that word at all. They don't talk about nationalism. They don't talk about nation, right? They talk about Indonesia, but they talk about it within the frame of our communism. Go figure. That is, that is the puzzle. Once you go out of this frame, dominant framework, right? Anders, Benedict Anderson helped us to understand the origin of nationalism and the form, the nature of nationalism. But we do need to excavate the dynamics of the adoption of that nationalism because that's because once we do that, then we are able to unpack this global, um, not just the global interaction, but also how the local decide to adopt the, the global. All right, so, so that's the approach. So essentially then, there is this, uh, I, with the approach of communication, I studied the infrastructure using, uh, just tracing communication technology of shipping lines. And this is the first chapter, shipping lines and railways. I, and actually maps also. Maps is very important ideological materials at the time to imagine this unified Dutch East Indies, right? But anyway, so that is the infrastructure of connection and integration and, uh, how do you call it, entanglement. And then I also follow people, sailors like Jamaluddin Tamim, who, you know, uh, when the, the revolt was looming, he moved, he went in exile to, um, you know, Malaysia and Singapore, right? Um, and as sailors to different places in Southeast Asia, essentially to escape, right? Um, but also, you know, he didn't stop. Be uh, to become a, what is it um, a, a communist, right? But he actually continued to produce writings as he was uh, doing his um, uh, you know his day job basically, and that's the reason why in that chapter, that's the last chapter, I talk about the other labor, right? The other labor is this that you know, a lot of activists, we think about mobilization and movement as this big event. We come up with dates and the leaders. We don't think about the very day-to-day -day process of, you know, mobilizing, which is very much labor, right? And oftentimes this is unpaid. This was unpaid. Janodintan did exactly that. He would do his job as a sailor, um, you know, uh, to get money, to feed him. But at the same time, at night, he would be writing for newspapers, writing reports and all that, which is itself also a kind of labor. This labor, the other labor was not, you, did, you don't get paid for that, you don't get salary, but there is something else beyond wage that he's looking for that he get, in which he get this fulfillment, which is this idea. And I can't say, tell you the quote right now on top of my head, but he says something about this is for kemanusiaan, this is for humanity, this is for liberty, this is for freedom. These are all language of, emancipa of emancipatory language of enlightenment, right? And also communism. Um, that again, re as rhetorical strategy, so they get mixed together. And so, so there is that following somebody, following Jamaluddin Tamim. So that's really like, if I talk about geography of, of communist struggle, well, it is messy because it's like moving around. There is not really one picture of a map of Dutch East Indies, for example. But also, I, I also uh, study the local manifestations of the global, which is really important because the global is not going to be global if it's not instantiated and also manifested at the local level, reproduced and on a, day, on a daily basis. Right, and through singing songs internationally, um, 
oh, what's the name? Mariana. Mariana was actually uh, from French Revolution song that was then translated into, into Dutch and then from Dutch into Malay, right? And then being sung every day, but during the public meetings, right? So this is, this is the global. This is the global in practice, in the making. And when you think about the global, when it died down, it died down first in the local level when, when people no longer adopt that. And that happened after uh, the communist revolt, right? When, you know, two decades later, the Indies is all about national revolution and it, they are, uh, you know, consumed, the energy cons is consumed for national revolution. But before that, in my period, it was a period of very fun, creative, uh, you know, um, experiments of um, you know, emancipation and imagining them, emancipating themselves, not just to make, create Indonesia as a nation, but actually to create communism. What does that mean? Work, local workers taking, uh, uh, you know, overcome or take control of means of production and rule them as a part of this communist network globally. And obviously we need to also put in mind that communism was also at the time was still very much you know, very nice. <laughs> Let me just put that word <laughs> before it becomes, you know, Stalinism and all kind of like, <laughs> yeah. It was, it was early in its own history, right, in that. Um, so that's lovely. I want to remind folks who are attending, please feel free to throw questions either for individual panelists or for uh, the panel as a whole. Um, so please feel free to do that. I guess I'll take my last kind of moderator's prerogative and ask all of you to comment on um, so at least in part, and not necessarily in all of your work, but at least in part, um, you all are basically writing about losers in history, right? The, the self-reliant group ultimately loses in the context of the revolutions that, John, that you look at, and at least the Philippine Revolution fails in the face of U.S. colonialism. Clearly, the Indonesian and Vietnamese revolutions succeed, although there are clearly losers within those moments you know communism does not succeed in java or indonesia as a whole um and later the pka pka is destroyed so just kind of how do we try to think about understanding or uncovering the kind of the the legacies or the genealogies of kind of losers in history do they you know is it a kind of a nice little story you know of historical interest or do we do we see some kind of layering of that that emerges in, in subsequent moments? Um, and maybe John, we'll start with you this time. Okay, um, I mean, here is where you know, there, there are uh, differences and departures um, between our, our, our books that are, are worthy of note. And mine is a comparative study. And so I'm interested in the also rams and the the woulda, coulda, shouldas of Southeast Asian history and, and of these revolutions. And, and for example, Tan Malaka, one of the great tragic losers of modern Southeast Asian history, you know, he, he gets a lot of play, not only for what he, you know, for his own suffering and, and the failure of his project, but his contribution to what does happen. So, um, so I think as uh, in particular, and Martina exemplifies, this uh, in her work, as as a, a new generation of scholars of Vietnamese history have emphasized, you know, there, there's a whole other set of forces and contributors intellectually and politically and socially to Vietnamese history who are overshadowed if we just think of the, the kind of telos of uh, the victory of the Communist Party. Um, but insofar as I, I, I am considering those uh, losers or also rams um, uh, or victims uh, of, uh, of late 19th and early 20th century history. I'm also in my comparative analysis keen to use that for a kind of counterfactual uh, analysis. And so unlike a proper historian, which I'm not, who would study this for its own sake, um, there's more of a kind of structural, if not determinism, than, than a degree of determination that I'm keen to, you know, suggest that, you know, th those people or those projects, those alternative pathways that failed, um, that ran aground, at the, on the one hand, they contributed to uh, Indonesian, Philippine, Vietnamese history. On the other hand, 
their, uh, their failure, their, their loss was not purely a matter of um, contingency, but there were, that requires explanation. And my account, I think, tries to account for the particular forms and pathways of these revolutions that they assumed as opposed to alternative ones. So in the Vietnamese case, there may be a, a difference you know, between me and Martina in the sense that I'm kind of suggesting that, well, a certain form of republicanism you know, didn't succeed for a, a whole set of maybe structural reasons, rightly or wrongly, that's my argument in there. And, and I guess in the case of the Indonesian revolution, what is also a, a big part of the argument there is that both Islam and communism were forces institutionally and discursively, which I'm showing were absolutely crucial to the revolution and contrary politically and intellectually to the notion that these two forces were somehow at odds with and you know, betraying the revolution, that without communism and Islam, the Indonesian revolution would have been even more disappointing in its outcome. Um, and even much weaker than it turned out to be. And if the idea that Islam and communism were traitors to the Indonesian revolution, it's the other way around. They were, the, the, the communist and Islamic um, forces mobilized in, in inspired by certain dreams and hopes of what an independent Indonesia would be like. They were betrayed by the Republicans, by the Republic. They were, you know, victimized. Um, so that, that there is, you know, politically as well as intellectually, there are lessons I think to be learned, as, as I think there, there there are in Martina and Anne's accounts. But I think, you know, where where I differ is is that I'm coming at it from a, a more kind of structuralist analysis, um, where I suggest a kind of long durée and a kind of uh, comparative historical sociological account that I could detail as to why things ended up in one train track. You know, as opposed to another one form of revolution and an outcome rather than the next. So that's a different approach to to losers, and it's more social sciency. History repeats itself first as tragedy, then as farce, then as political science. <laughs> <laughs> as a Earl. fellow political scientist, I can totally yes. Awful. Um, and I'm wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about that. How you think about because here was this vital kind of still at the early stages of kind of in the history of communism, this vital movement. And then as one looks at the, the trajectory of that, how do, how, do we kind of, how do we kind of understand that? Yeah, so I'm gonna start with Thomas Carlyle, famous uh, you know, quote. He said, no great man lives in vain. The history of the world is but the biography of great man, hmm. right? Well, if you wanna see, uh, if you want to see it from the per great man, right? Like how wrong is that? I mean, for the perspective of our time, but uh, he, if you want to see it from the perspective of hero versus losers, then my book is about losers of history, and, but they are heroes of my book that ended tragically. But I refuse to see them as losers or heroes, obviously, because for, that, for me, they are ordinary people with the their own conditions of limits and conditions of possibility. And that, uh, you know, and what we do then, it's very important to seek understanding instead of their, uh, you know, the idea of eman emancipation, right? The way to understand it for me is to understand their feelings, their misery, fear, dissatisfaction, but also hopes, aspirations that you cannot really tell again from uh, official documents, but instead through, you know, these songs, poems, stories, and memories. Right, but here's another thing that I want to say in terms of these losers, <laughs> uh, these ordinary people. In fact, in my uh, book, my book manuscript, play a very important role in continually, uh, continuously reproducing vocabulary and aspiration of emancipation. And where did that come from? I haven't really talked about where this did this enlightenment come from. So. When you read the newspapers, when you read the articles, many of them say, we're going to fight colonialism dengan berkesopanan, by being polite. I'm just doing the literate, literate translation. So by being polite, uh, kesopanan, uh, and then polite through politeness, kepandaian, smartness, and berpengetahuan through uh, science, right? But it is really weird. Where did those words come from? So. So, but, so what I did was I went back to Kartini's book, the original book that she wrote in a Dutch 
and she wrote the words, she uses the word beshaping. Bish they were beshaping and untwinkling. Untwinkling means, um, you know, awakening, right? But beshaping means enlightenment. So when in 19, and then I rechecked the translation in English of, by Agnes Louis Simers that's published in 1921. And she did all of the translation of beshaping as enlightenment. And guess what? This is what's interesting. In 1922, version of the translation that it, the Malay translation by Balai Pustaka, the word beshaving slash enlightenment in English is translated in a more varied Malay words. There is no not one word to translate this with. And what were the words? Berkesopanan, kepandaian, berpengetahuan, which were the words exactly that the Indonesian communists use whenever they say, let's do, let's organize by berkesopanan means let's mobilize and unite in an organization. You know, but this you cannot really tell if you don't you, if you don't seek for this connection and entanglement, right? And okay, you might want to argue, well, Kartini is not. If you see it from a Kartini, is not a, an enlightenment. Kartini is very much influenced by Multatuli, right? Who wrote Max Havelar, and Multatuli was trained or uh, grew in uh, uh, enlightenment traditions, and. Um, and it's not just that. In fact, Multa, uh, Max Havla, uh, sorry, those Decker, uh, Multatuli, it's his pen name. Pen name. Uh, he also inspired, uh, you know, Sigmund Freud, who write about in, uh, the sexual enlightenment of children and all that. So this is where enlightenment ideas actually continue to be reproduced and repurposed, you know, um, and in my case, through ordinary people. Thanks very much. And Martina, um, you know, so the kind of the same thing. So certainly individual members of uh, the literary group, some of them go on, some of them have tra tragic endings that your book discusses, some go on to become, you know, occupy important positions, uh, high status positions in the revolutionary government. So how do we kind of understand, was it just at the end of the day, intellectuals are going to be, you know, stenographers to power, and they're unreliable. Like, how do how do we understand their commitment to cosmopolitan nationalism, you know, in the face of, you know, the rise of the Viet Minh and the revolution? Yeah, I, 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 to to sort of just comment, you know, to go back to John's end point mm -hmm. about how history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. um, a historian would actually never say that because that, uh, when you dig into a context deep enough, you find that history never repeats never itself repeats. and right. that historical events, you know, come about from very, you know, specific context, times, places, and influences. So, so you know, I think this this sort of speaks to the the I guess the the sort of worldview difference between you know political scientists and social sciences scientists like John and you know the, the two Johns today and you know a historian um, like me. But I, I I you know getting to this question of you know the 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 losers in history, right? The story of losers. Um, I, I, first of all, on top of the fact that I love a really, really good underdog story, um, you know, the, the, the story of the losers and my interest in this kind of underdog story actually emerged from my own experience growing up as a Vietnamese American in America, right? Um, and growing up in the Vietnamese American community, my parents came over in 1975. You know, they were sort of that early wave of boat people who, you know, would rather die on the seas than live under communism. And so, so, so my very kind of family story is 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 one of the losing side, right? And so, so growing up, I got this narrative of, you know, yeah, all the stories that, all the narratives that I was, I was learning about in school, right? The Ziet, the Ngoding Ziet regime, all of the stuff that I was getting about the Vietnam War in school didn't really jive with the, the, the stories I was hearing at home, right? Like my, you know, my family, you know, my family is, you know, Northern 54 came, you know, fled South in 54, 75 fled Saigon, um, 
And so, you know, they were Catholics. And, and so, so my family is, is Catholic. And so for us, like Zim was the one hope for saving South Vietnam, you know? And of course in school, in AP US history, I was getting that he was corrupt and awful. And, you know, so, so, so there was these kinds of things, you know, so, so for me, like, I guess the, the kind of interest in the, the losers, right? Is coming from this place of being, you know, of being part of this kind of, I, I guess what you can call like this, like underlying Republican tradition, you know, Republican with a small R tradition, um, it, that kind of is, 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 has always been under the surface of, you know, the Vietnamese American community, right, the Vietnamese diaspora. And so these kind of, you know, uh, 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 discourses of the enlightenment, right, of freedom, of rule of law, of civil society, of all these kinds of, of things that it's always kind of been there. Um, and so, so, so when I encountered Vietnamese history in its kind of monolithic, you know, communist narrative, it, it basically describes everything as this kind of, um, you know, unstoppable march towards communism. Uh, and, and, you know, and I, 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 a part of me thought to myself, wait, where, where does my family's role in this, right? Where does, where is the role of the Vietnamese South in all of this, right? So, so, so for me, like, you know, I, it, it, part of this project at the, uh, under the interest in the losing side is to kind of uncover this, you know, this thing that's always been under the surface of things, right? And there's, in, in the past kind of 10 years, there's been an enormous amount of scholarship in Vietnamese studies on this, this you know idea of republicanism, you know both in colonial republicanism, um, you know Peter Zinnemann's book, you know Chris Gosha talks about this, you know in and especially in the kind of newer generation of scholars that John talks about, you know my generation and and even you know later, um, they're really grappling with this question of of the set of of the Vietnamese Republic, right, and the ideas of republicanism that undergirded it, um, and so. So basically, for me, I guess my my uh, my story about paths not taken is, you know, it's it's uh, I actually think that it's not over yet, right? In a certain sense, maybe we're having a kind of uh, you know, it, it, maybe Republicanism is having a kind of like last laugh in this moment, right? Because you know, you look at the work of the Self Reliant Literary Group, their work becomes, you know, kind of, especially for, you know, the diaspora as well, even in Vietnam, their work is read as this kind of, you know, kind of emblematic of this kind of, you know, individual freedoms and this, like the, these various kind of uh, values, right, that is often tied to, you know, liberal, you know, Republican values. And, um, and um, yeah, and and actually, there the group enjoys popularity when Vietnam is the most internationally engaged, right? When Vietnam is the most open to the world outside, and so so in the you know in the past, I don't know, like four or five years, there's been in Vietnam and in the United States, there's been sort of four edited volumes about the self reliant literary group. You know, there's been you know uh, uh, my book came out. There's been a couple of other manuscripts that you know systematically you know looks at various parts of the group's work. And so, so you know, for me, it, I. I I, I hesitate to say that it's a, a losing story just yet because you know the the losers may have lost right it, you know at least in this very you know politically um, you know political sense right sure they lost to the communists if you want to think about it that simplistically but their legacy le lives on in their influences and it, it might not be recognizable and we may not be able to attribute you know uh, uh, this influence to them. But it's there, and you know, it's kind of always been there. It kind of remains beneath the surface of all of this. So, um, you know, for example, you know, just a more concrete example is the Vietnamese Aozai, right? So the Vietnamese national costume. The the group published what is historically, you know, I argue is the they basically invented the idea of the Vietnamese national costume in their newspapers. People are still wearing it today and people have, you know, without question, love this garment, uh, unquestionably accepted it as emblem of the Vietnamese national identity, but it has a beginning date of 1934. So, so, so these, you know, but nobody remembers the group for inventing it, right? So, so these are the kinds of things that I, I'm interested in, I look at. Um, so I'll stop there. You no, know, absolutely, and and arguably, right? The at some level, whatever one 
the Vietnamese revolution is not over, right? Yeah. Like history is not ended. We don't, we're not at the last moment in history. Um, so if people will indulge me, I know it's one o'clock, but we did have one question from Margaret um, who wanted to specifically addressing the question around Islam and communism in the Indonesian revolution. And basically they did work together in the context of that revolution, um, but working together didn't last as long as maybe one might have hoped, um, was that clash kind of fundamentally inevitable? Um, and and I think this is directed particularly to John, but also Anne, uh, feel free to weigh in. Um, and, and how were, could you be a little more explicit about how is Islamists and communists were betrayed by the Republicans in Indonesia? So, so the, the two questions are, was it inevitable? The, and then how, how were they betrayed? Okay, so um, great question, uh, tricky question. Um, in the book, I, I show that there's a moment that we can find in the, in the teens and the early 20s um, that Anne covers um, quite closely in greater depth than I do. Uh, and it's there in, um, in the Dutch East Indies, in Indonesia, and it's also there internationally in which it seems like there's the possibility of an alignment uh, between Islam and you know, Bolshevik-led communism, uh, communist parties. And you know, I, I think we, we find historically over the course of the 20th century that um, that becomes a, a source of polarization between Islamist parties that actually learn from and, and whether they admit it or not, imitate communist parties in all sorts of ways uh, across the Muslim world, whether it's in, you know, and, and, and Islamist mobilization is stimulated by fear of left-wing socialist, Ba'ath socialist, Nasserist, and, and communist party mobilization. So I think, you know, if, if even though one can see the contingent possibilities and, and the brief period of, of overlap and integration that we find in the figure of Haji Mizbach, um, in the late teens and early 20s, uh, celebrated by Takashi Shiraishi and, and others, as we see again in Anne's work, that, that it, it doesn't last. And, and so that suggests to me, uh, because it doesn't survive anywhere, uh, and it ends up quite divided and polarized everywhere, that this is, um, you know, that, that there are powerful forces beyond, you know, some sort of strange contingency that people just, you know, the ships passed in the night and they missed each other. There were missed opportunities. And here I can think of, 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 a, of a set of underlying differences in terms of the, the infrastructures of mobilization, the bases of mobilization, um, the uh, different forms of knowledge production, of, of forms of authority, um, that the two you know, kinds of uh, forces really uh, exemplify and mobilize. So I don't think it's really just a matter of, you know, uh, atheism versus religion, something like that. I don't think of it as, as really just um, a matter of belief as such. But I think in terms of underlying structures of authority and of claims to speak in the name of, of different collectivities, um, as well as different kinds of geographical, spatial, and sociological bases, in the Indonesian case, there. There, there are these different kinds of bases. And there are also different you know, possibilities for alignment with other forces. So I think it's fair to say that some of the Islamic associations that drift away from the, the radicalism of the, the pergerakan, the sarakat Islam, they then make their peace with the Dutch in a way that the communists clearly don't. don't. And likewise, if we think of Masyumi, um, then covering not just uh, Masyumi, but Nakhita Ulama as well, during the revolution, they make their, their peace with, uh, well, with, with Dutch and international capital in terms of what they, a kind of post-independence Indonesia as they envisage it. So I think, I think there are, that, that's how I see it more sociologically as my book. I more, feel more comfortable and confident speaking sociologically in this sense, rather than ideologically and making assumptions about people's beliefs. Um, but I, as for the question of betrayal, I, I think of it in these terms. If we look at the, the, the forces that are mobilized in the revolution on the ground, 
as it gets going in, in the fall, the autumn of 1945, on the ground, the kinds of forces that are mobilized are led by local kiai, are led by groups that are Islamic or Islamist and communist in their discourse and their infrastructure. They seize plantations, um, uh, control over plantations. They overthrow and murder local aristocracies. They're local social revolutions that are variously Islamic and communist or, or left-wing and variously revolutionary socialist in their inflections. And we can see that the, the Republic at the national level, it recognizes the strength of these forces in the kind of pseudo parliamentary political party representation that it offers. And if you look at the, the cabinets, you know, the, the oddity of the Indonesian revolution is that they, they have political, they say, let's organize political parties <laughs> in the middle of a revolution and, and let's have ca a cabinet, you know, a, a kind of, and, and you can see there's a, a, the Sayap Kiri, the left wing political, you know, uh, uh, leadership seizes control of the cabinet and the prime minister's position. Um, and then that's upended. Um, and I think that, you know, you can see that on the ground, uh, those forces are, are very powerful in terms of actually mobilizing people. And, and that's appreciated at the center. And over the course of the revolution, we see that, you know, the left is purged. And that's what ends up in Madiun is actually the, 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 the purging of what had become a sort of left wing usurpation of control over uh, or attempt to control the army and a purging of the left. Um, and, and, a, and a last ditch resistance in the face of that. And likewise, you know, as the Republic makes its peace with the Dutch, retreats from parts of Java, shrinks in terms of its area of, of control, the forces that are then seen as somehow, you know, betraying the revolution because they're talking about a, a Dar ul Islam, an, an abode of Islam, they're continuing to fight against the Dutch. And you actually have, you know, coordination between Dutch and Republican forces against them. You have collaboration between the TNI, the, the, the Tentara Nacional Indonesia, and the Dutch against the, you know, the Islamic forces. So I think, who betrayed whom? You know, I, I think, and, and, and this goes back to the losers. I mean, there's also the pretense of the winners. In, in, in this country where I live, you know, everyone thinks uh, Nelson Mandela is, is the most admirable person in the world. Well, no one wants to admit that Nelson Mandela, if he wasn't a member of the South, African Communist Party, he was certainly a fellow traveler who was sponsored and supported and secretly helped along the way by the Communist Party. And, you know, back in the Cold War, the, the governments here, they knew that. And so they wouldn't touch him with the 10 foot pole. And it's convenient later in the day to think of him as this great nationalist leader, but let's not forget. Yeah, and did you wanna chime in? Yes. <laughs> um, I think I think that's a great question, but there is a danger to that question because it is it assumes that there is one Islam and there is one communism. Because in fact, once you see it at the very local, material, everyday process, you know, ordinary process, then you you see that yes, there is a clash between Islamism and communism. The marriage is between the two of them was very short. It was a bad marriage <laughs> it ended up in a bad divorce as well and so um <laughs> and so what we need to ask is actually what is the islam that is expressed what were how was islam being expressed what and what how was is communism being expressed and being seen and what were what created this clash and if you study that and especially in the 1920s right you study, yes, there is a Sarekat Islam where, was actually mobilized at the beginning by PKI, you know, by communist uh, uh, leaders. But then later on, there were some, started to be some clash, you know, in the articles, you know, that Sono wrote about the case of embezzlement uh, by, by the leader uh, of SE. And so, so the cases are actually becomes very mundane. But it triggered the Sarekat Islam, the Islamic Union people to say, well, we don't want to be mixed with you anymore. You know what? And then there started to be this propaganda article saying that, oh, Islam is exclusive. It's perfect. You know, we don't need to uh, communism to help us to liberate ourselves. Um, the core, in the Quran, Islam needs to be protected uh, from the contamin contamination like communism. 
And you know what happened in response to that? Remember, everything is relational and dialectical. So communism, in response to that exclusivity, say that we are an inclusive movement. Yes, it's OK. The, Mus the Muslims will leave us. We will change Islamic union, Sarekat Islam, change it into Sarekat Rastiat. We become people's union. You know, they open up and they say that our movement cannot just be for Muslims. If it were to be for humanity, then everybody is welcome, right? And so this idea, so when you see that the progression of idea to be more inclusive, to be more egalitarian, to be, um, to be more equal occur, not just in response to colonialism, right? the colonial uh, state or the day-to-day -day colonial policing, for example, but also, uh, you know, in response to uh, the, the Islamists that were um, very much rigid in the way they uh, understand Islam. So in that case, also we learned that Islam could be interpreted very differently when it was in communication, interacted with these communist uh, slash enlightenment ideas. So thanks very much to our panelists. Um, I, we've gone over time and we want to be respectful of, of everyone's time commitments and so forth. Um, so, and also I want to correct to correct an oversight as one of the co-sponsors of the webinar, the APEC Study Center at Columbia and want to acknowledge their support as well. So thanks everyone for joining. Thanks uh, Srinith for uh, keeping us all together logistically and for Margaret Scott, who I believe had the original idea for this panel and workshop. And of course, for, uh, for Anne, Martina and John um, for writing you know, three lovely, uh, books and that um, and for joining us today. Um, this has been absolutely a pleasure. Um, so best luck, everyone. Thanks oh, to you, John. Like, oh, thank you. A quick reminder, uh, John Seidel's book is available from Cornell University Press. Martina's from the University of Hawaii. And <laughs> Anne's will be uh, available soon from a press to be named. And, uh, and thanks, everyone. And have a lovely weekend.